This is chapter 10 of my book, Avadapwa, A Life of Weight. The epigraph is from Marjorie Williams. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to those that, who, that do not understand. The Velveteen Rabbit. Rabbit. I stood at the bus stop, nervous about meeting the kids in the neighborhood. Smiling girls quickly surrounded me. Boys stood off to the side. One of the boys had curly brown hair and a row of bangs that fell into brown eyes and a quick smile. I felt my heartbeat quicken. I tried not to stare. I tried. There was something different about these kids. They lived in nicer houses, wore skirt and sweater outfits that matched, and they didn't even think about stealing nail polish. I didn't have a house. My father was in Texas and I'd grown up in Dormont, so I was a little odd, but I tried to remember they weren't meeting Fatty Patty. They were meeting Tish. I tried. When I was invited to their house after school, we sat in paneled game rooms with music on stereo systems. They passed around bags of chips or corn curls. I watched while the other girls chomped down handfuls of snacks, snacks and remained thin. If I didn't eat the chips, I felt left out. If I did eat them, I worried that I might gain weight. I tried not to eat too many. I tried. When I didn't go to anyone's house after school, I went to an empty apartment. I wore the key on a chain around my neck so I wouldn't lose it. I'd call mom at work to let her know that I was home. Then I went to the cupboard and looked for Pop-Tarts or cookies. I ate because I was hungry and a dinner would, dinner would have to wait for mom to come home and cook. I ate one Pop-Tart. A few minutes later, I'd eat another and then another. The record on the stereo blared while I talked on the phone with friends and ate Pop-Tarts. I was gaining weight. Mom decided, mom and I decided to go on a diet together. We did a protein diet on which we ate plates of scrambled eggs for breakfast and hamburger patties for lunch or for dinner. We also made Friday night trips to Swenson's ice cream parlor. The rest of the week I drank gallons of diet soda and tried not to think about Pop-Tarts. I tried. I wanted to be with my friends spending hours in little diners eating french fries and pizza and talking about boys. Sometimes I did that and then I lived on diet soda for a few days. In the lexicon of the diet world, I was yo-yo dieting, feast and famine, losing and gaining and losing. For many bodies, weight, cycle, weight, cycle, weight cycling comes at an early age, coming at an early age can set up a pattern for life. Every time you diet, it becomes harder to lose. You need to eat much less for longer to lose any weight. Dieting while your body is still developing forms intractable patterns, physiologically and psychologically. The school district in which I now lived merged with the school district I'd grown up in and kids from both areas were sent to a middle school. Some of the people in the halls knew me as Fatty Patty and some of them knew me as Tish. On Friday, there was a football game. I was with some of my new friends. I saw a few girls from my old school. I turned to my new friends and said, pretend like you like me. They gave me a bemused look and said, we do like you. The kids from my old neighborhood were greasers, bad kids. They wore black leather jackets, smoked in the bleachers and kissed on the back of the bus on the way to school. The kids in my new neighborhood were jocks, good kids. They were interested in sports, wore leather jackets, leather jackets and got better grades. As always, there were the weird kids that lived in the margins. Now I toured the schoolyard wooing everyone. Hi, Joanne, how's Nikki? Cheryl. Nice nail polish. Love the way the color matches your bubble ring. Have you guys met my new friend Elaine? Helene, Lisa, nice to meet you. Uh, nice to see you again, but I gotta run. Hi, Lois. I was elected president of my class. Some of my new friends and I formed a singing group. We were five girls, so we called ourselves the weekdays. We sang harmonies on songs like California Dreaming and Going to the Chapel. We had dance steps for each song, rehearsed for hours in the basement of each other's homes. Each girl was featured in a song. Song, Mine was Hang On Sloopy. The only time we performed was at an after-school dance. No one danced while we sang. <laughs> we messed up on three of the songs we knew. Not an auspicious debut, but surely the beginning of something. The boy with the curly brown hair and the row of bangs that fell into brown eyes and a quick smile was Gary Domblowski. He was the center on the football team and he was on the basketball team and the wrestling team. Suddenly I liked sports. Every day after school for exercise, he ran up the hill behind my apartment building. There was a picnic table on the hill and every day after school, I sat there pretending to do homework. He smiled and he said hi as he ran past and I tried to pretend I was surprised to see him. He sat near me in Latin class. 
one row up and one seat to the left. I stared at the back of his head and the crescent slice of his profile in which he looked at, and he, while he looked at the chalkboard. I drew rows of hearts on the cover of my notebook. Martin Luther King was shot in, Ap in April of 1968. I remember that feeling in my body when I first heard the word nigger. I remembered my grandmother maintaining her distance from the black folks on the bus. Martin Luther King was the Afri African American who would love away all the hatred. He and Cesar Chavez were the pictures from Life magazine taped on a board nailed to the back of a bookshelf. Joan Baez and the Supremes were faces on album covers. I learned diversity from culture. I had learned racism as the faulty re reasoning of a few and faraway people. I knew that there were things going on in the world, but I wasn't, the, I wasn't living in the middle of it. I felt like I should be part of something, of doing something about it. In, a cla in classroom conversations, I was ardent in my defense of civil rights. My teachers dubbed me the hippie. One night, I fell asleep with the radio on. I woke up to hear that Bobby Kennedy had been shot and killed. A few months later, the Democratic Convention was the site of demonstrations and riots. For mom, Saturday was the day to get chores done. For me, it was a day to walk around with my girlfriends and talk about boys. Mom and I were at cross purposes and in a shifting relationship. She wanted me to have fun, but she also wanted me to help and be responsible. I had a list of chores. I had a list of chores I had to do before I could leave the house to hang out with my friends on weekends. I had to vacuum all the rugs and clean the kitchen floor. I had to clean the bathroom. When I was done, mom would go in and check for soap scum that I might have missed. I rolled my eyes and complained. The minute she said I could go, I raced out the door to be with a friend. Mom never told me that I had to clean the toilet bowl. She cleaned it after I left. In my adult life, I could never understand why the water in the bowl didn't automatically clean itself the way it did when I was growing up. For years, I would look at the toilet bowl brushes and wonder what they were. Mom tried to hold me to some amount of responsibility, but she couldn't ask me to put my hand in the toilet bowl. It took two years, but Ken got a divorce and my mother married. She was able to transfer to the IRS in Washington, DC as well. They bought a house in Wheaton, Maryland, and we made plans to move. The house was a four bedroom ranch with a big yard in front and in back. We could choose our own landscaping and our wallpaper and our rugs, but otherwise our house looked exactly like the house, two houses up from our house and two houses up from that. Hold on. <laughs>